So I, I realized that there were nine weeks in the APP fast track and that my personal goal is nine miles an hour on the stand-up paddleboard. I can hit nine miles an hour on an outrigger canoe, so I know in terms of like neurological speed and power, I can get a craft up to that speed, but I can't, with the resistance of stand-up and the length of the paddle, there's just something about it that I, I can't seem to hit nine miles an hour yet. But is nine weeks enough? to to go from my current top speed ever i believe is about an 8.6 miles per hour on a stand-up in nine weeks neurologically strength wise and you know cardiovascularly can i train myself nine weeks is a long time can i get myself to nine miles an hour in nine weeks I ran out to the lake and did some preliminary tests, but I still wanted to consult the gurus before tackling something this fast to see if they thought I could. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. But how long do you have to hold it? You don't have to hold it for very long. No, you can hit it and then completely peter out. Yeah, you will, but that's okay. With their votes of confidence, I went out to post another time. The practice the previous week had started me on my neurological preparations, but I wanted a real baseline speed with the equipment I'd be using throughout the entire nine weeks. I, I think a workout like that, um, a training program that targets top end speed is what you're going to need to want to have a top end speed. So, like I, I know you had a post earlier about uh, training the nervous system to just move that fast. And, you know, it's, it's training yourself to be coordinated at those speeds. And in order to do that, you got to put yourself there and fail. Lot. Armed with just the knowledge that I would likely hit a wall when I hit my goal speed, I went out and gave it another shot. I hit 8.94 miles per hour. Was my 9 mile per hour goal too low? I seriously doubt it. That last bit is going to take a lot of power. What are some ways to train, other than going all out, for hitting a max speed? Rest weeks with lower resistance craft like the outrigger canoe and chasing boats may be helpful. It's a feel thing because once you feel what it feels like to go that speed and you learn it even in a craft that's faster, when you get to your stand up, you're going to try to find that feeling of speed when you look for it, even though it's harder or more resistance. So if you paddle an outrigger, you can hit speeds that you normally don't in a stand up. Um, what I found in the stand up is it requires a minimum amount of power to really get it running, which I feel that you're going to have no problem. We're not worried about trying to be stronger to go faster, but at those higher speeds, what we find in the outrigger is because they're so efficient, they get light really fast. Mm -hmm. And then once the board gets light or the canoe gets light, people actually lose their feel for the water. Yeah. So now they're just swinging and hacking at whatever they can, as opposed to actually accelerating, grabbing and moving. And when the board starts to actually lift up and plane, there are certain things you have to do to get it there, and then you have to do different things to, to accelerate from that point. And on the outrigger, going really fast is where you learn that stuff the easiest way possible without having to be mm. a Olympic champion or world champion to move the board that speed. So in the outriggers, I can practice um, essentially less drag, which is what happens at the top end of the sprint. Some like Annie and I do these workouts, or he and I, he has that training. Uh, program that it's kind of I do the same thing where you eat 20 second pieces and he calls it over speed and I, I call it speed work right so in that 20 seconds you're looking for how fast can you get the boat moving how little time basically you have in the air is a big part mm -hmm. and how much pressure is on that blade right so you're looking for max boat speed and we do those like a 20 second on with a three minute off or something like that that we do it gives you a chance every three minutes to push that speed high. And you have, you start to learn, that's, you know, that's to me is true speed. Work. You start to learn what the speed is because you have that long rest. That teaches you, I believe, to get your speed up higher, no matter what, whether you're a speed person or an endurance person. Most people go hard, but they don't sprint. They just go hard until they're a little bit tired. These 20 second workouts are amazing for, hey, go to failure. If you fail at 17 seconds, get a stop early. But the goal is figuring out, uh, practicing going fast, and then starting to recognize over those, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, um, where you're slowing down first, and then finding out how to, you know, essentially I call it coordinated top speed. It's a it's a really big deal. Everyone can move body parts fast, but to move all of them together fast is so difficult. 
moving body parts all together fast. I watched some of the slow motion video from my first attempt and I had a lot of moving parts, but coordinated movement wasn't what I would call it. Where many people may benefit from some strength training and power development, I was getting the feeling that it may be technique that was holding me back. And, you know, uh, bending these guys, they call it that old speed stuff, but it does, it teaches you to go faster than you thought you could, and then you, you try to do it again. So I went out for my second attempt. The plan was to do five 15 second warm ups before doing five full attempts in the channel. After my warm-ups, I ended up doing one full practice run with the wind for the neurological practice. Then I hydrated because it was really, really hot out. Once I was in the channel, I made my first try. I did some quick math, but nothing on my GPS indicated that I even got close to nine miles per hour. Later analysis revealed an 8.8. .8. You could see the disappointment in my face. My second try, I faltered on the jump up and I reacted. It ended up being an 8.7, I paddled around to cool down before trying to get in the right headspace for my third and final attempt of the day. I had had enough. It was oppressively hot and my palms were sweaty. Wearing only a bikini to beat the heat, I didn't have anywhere to wipe the slimy lake water and sweat off of my hands. I wasn't breaking nine today. I was going to go finish this one and perform my last interval in the main channel on my way home. With the wind, just to see if I could even hit nine miles an hour with an assist. Three. Two, one. I hopped up and tried my longer, more connected, more powerful stroke. I finished the effort and looked down at my watch. If I had hit a fast time, it was too quick for me to see it. I was feeling like this nine mile an hour idea was stupid. I hydrated and headed home. In my homeward bound interval, there was a slight tailwind, so I shortened my stroke and tried a faster cadence with a push. Still, no nine miles an hour appeared on my GPS. I was utterly defeated. Once at the house, I was unable to look at any of my speeds from the session due to the massive Garmin outage. That weekend, Angela Fernandez topped my leading speed in the APP Fast Track. When Garmin Connect finally came back online after the outage, I rushed to look at my interval session. I checked my speed and I couldn't believe it. There it was, a 9.6. To be sure, it was out in the main channel with a little push from the wind, but nope. It was in the protected canal. I had busted through my goal with my own paddling power. Well, I did it. But of course, anytime you achieve a goal, you just want to make a new one. So I would love to break 10 miles an hour. To do this, I'm going to have to up my game. All right, well, if you got to get good at something really fast, there's only one way to do it. Come on. is approaching to give it your best and you've got to reach your prime that's when you need to put yourself to the test and show us a passage of time we're gonna need a montage, montage. a sports training montage. montage show a lot of things happening at once remind everyone of what's going on what's going and with on? every shot show a little improvement to show it all would take too long that's called a montage, montage. even rocky had a montage. montage in any sport if you want to go from just a beginner to a pro you need a montage, montage. a simple little montage. montage always fade out montage. in a montage Fade out, it seems like more time has passed in a montage. Montage. All right. Everyone keeps telling me how much faster I'm going to be in salt water. So let's just load up the van and go three and a half hours to do a time trial in salt water. That is not feasible for most people. Um, nah, but I'm gonna do it. Let's just, let's go see. Uh, everybody down there is posting pretty fast time. So I just wanna see if I go and do 
my time trial where a lot of the Wilmingtonians are doing theirs is the salt water make you that much more buoyant. Um, you know, there's, it's just, the water isn't as still as it is here in this freshwater lake. And the hypothesis is that I should be substantially faster. So, so this is my trial, salt water in the inlet. We'll see how this goes. Five, four, three, two, one. After my first two attempts, clocking a 9.1 and a 9.6, I realized it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. For some reason, I assumed that busting through 10 miles an hour is going to be a cakewalk in the salt water, but it wasn't. People clocking fast times in salt water are still working their butts off to hit those times. So I definitely don't want to detract from what they've accomplished. Not to mention, if you didn't pick the right time to go out, there were many other challenges. Okay, slight caveat to salt water. Make sure it's not Saturday afternoon with literally hundreds of boats, not a calm spot of water to be had. I mean, you gotta do it when you can, right? Like you can't, it would have been nice to be out here at six in the morning, but I don't live here and that wasn't an option. Let's try this maybe again. We'll see. This is, uh, this is just looking not promising. I waited for a break in the boat traffic, which gave me a large recovery interval, and then I knuckled down. On my third attempt, I felt the board lift up and the resistance got a lot lighter. When this happened, I responded with a drastic increase in my stroke rate to keep it up and running. The result? was an absolute breakthrough in my speed. I looked down at my watch and the speed was more than obvious. I had obliterated 10 miles an hour to clock an 11.4 mile an hour speed on a stand up paddleboard. It's, it's really important there because um, people don't understand sometimes what 100% is or what a max speed is. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll train, they'll say, okay, I'm gonna do two minutes at 90% or I'm gonna do a minute at 100% and they're never really at that 100%. Mm -hmm. They're never at their max speed. When you do this workout with 20 second pieces, you can learn that, oh, I was thinking 95 was 100, or I was thinking 95 and my top speed was actually 100%, but it wasn't. Like you teach yourself to go above that level. Hitting an 11.4 was cool and all, but I wasn't feeling very accomplished. There was a lot of water moving with the tide, wind, and boat wakes. I wanted to accomplish my goal as I set out to do. Throughout the virtual challenge, I resisted peer pressure. No altered sensitivity settings on my watch, no using the most sensitive tracking app, no push from wind or water, no board mount versus wrist mount discrepancies. For me, reaching 10 miles an hour wasn't about winning a virtual online competition. Participating in the virtual competition is fun and it's a great way to see what others are capable of so that you're inspired to push your limits but it also has its dangers. Okay, so I, this morning, I'm out filming um, tip eight for the APP Fast Track, and I'm trying to display the tip to put your whole blade in the water. And to do so, I'm first not putting my whole blade in the water um, to show what it looks like when you're slipping, that the, the your top hand's moving so much faster than the whole speed. Guys, that hurt my bicep to do. It hurt very bad right through here and in kind of like right where the rotator cuff attaches here um, and right under my clavicle, like there's a little tension. That hurt just to display. So I, man, sometimes when I'm working on these things and I'm showing the improper way to do things, it, it hurts and I just kind of wanted to take a moment to say that because you've got to, you, you got to fix your technique if you're going to go hard. If someone in saltwater used all the tricks in the book to post a fast time and someone on flat, fresh, still water inland didn't and compared themselves to that other person, they could wind up really hurting themselves trying or worse, lose all hope. It's so important in this current age of virtual competition to set your own personal goals and not compare yourself to others, which is kind of a metaphor for life. 
You do you because you don't know what conditions other people may or may not be facing. I headed back to the lake to do one last time trial. But before heading out, I wanted to do everything right. I wanted to practice what I had been preaching in the APP fast track tips. So I went through the full protocol. I did a light warm up paddle before eating a big full breakfast with a balance of healthy carbs, protein, and fat. I rewatched a few technique videos and listened to a few more tips from Danny and John. Watch your videos of you paddling sprints and then look at all the little details because in a sprint, you're taking, you know, what you would normally do or we would do over an hour and you can make mistakes and make up for it. It's tiny, tiny little details and you look at it, you're like, oh, I obviously need to set my blade or I obviously shouldn't have my head rolled to the side, my hand wiggles. The things you do in a sprint, man, the things your body does in a sprint, you don't realize if you're not doing it because you fall, you know, kind of fall apart. <laughs> Accelerating and getting to that speed, I tend to be shorter and faster. Just a higher turnover, I'm looking for number of strokes just so that the load doesn't get too heavy to where I can't handle it. And then if I'm going for a top speed, which means I'm going to fail, as I push into that red line, I hit a point where it's not like a you know, thousand mile race, it's not a 10 mile race, not a one mile race, not even a one minute piece. I, if it's five more strokes and see what I got, I'll actually go longer and faster knowing that I'm going to fail. So I'm going for the rate and the distance and just knowing it's going away soon. I also decided to cut down one of my older paddles that had a larger blade. While the epoxy on my short, large paddle dried, I buffed the bottom of my board with Onnit Pro. Um, the bigger paddles are faster and hurt more because they hold on almost every time, even when you don't want them to. It's a yeah, reason why in stand up, they're starting to go skinny. And that was just because people were recognizing that it's a heavy load to paddle standing up as opposed to outrigger. And it's more forgiving if the paddle slips a little bit and you get tired as opposed to your arm grip on the sockets. And when you go to a bigger blade, say you're using a medium or a smaller blade and you're trying to do your speed work and you go to a bigger blade, you have to realize that you're going to have more time in the water. Yeah. You have to allow that to happen because you're holding water for longer and traveling farther. So there's... And when you go to a smaller blade, it's interesting because when people paddle with a big blade and they learn that feel of load, you can go to a little smaller blade, but you're still going to look for that feel you had with the big one. And you're going to find more load maybe for that blade, but maybe not as part of the body. I think a bigger blade is going to get you up to that speed pitch, but failure is coming from it too. I watched more Danny and Johnny tips while I ate lunch and sipped on a shake of Vitargo, banana, and mango. To this, I added creatine, CLA, beta alanine, tyrosine, beet powder, sport salts, CoQ10, vitamin D, and phosphatidic acid. When that was all gone, I hit the weight room and did my crossover symmetry warm up, followed by a few heavy lifts to increase my muscle tension. Instead of stretching, you may have seen this in the APP tips, stretching for something like a sprint is not beneficial because it relaxes the muscles. In a sprint, you'd benefit more from having tenser, tighter muscles because they translate energy better. Those of you that have been following me for a while know that I really believe in, those are different colors, I really believe in the crossover symmetry system to protect my shoulder and really balance my shoulder activation every time before I get on the water. I do not skip this. I have a way to strap this to doors when I'm traveling for races. I have um, these little clips that I hook it off to my car, like my roof rack. I do not leave home to race or paddle without this system. That is why you, uh, you do not see me using any like tape or, or bandaging anything because my shoulder musculature, it's not just strong, but it's balanced. I cannot obviously stress this enough or else I would not be making this blurb right now. So hold on, I'm gonna try something new. Try this code for, is it like 15% off your own set? And if they're running a sale, still use my code. It'll default to the highest percentage off they have that day at crossover, this way, crossoversymmetry.com. Did that, oh. That's probably ugly. Muscle tension. Muscle tension. So it's heavy. 
but that's good. Also, it's very heavy, but that's all I'm doing. Two to four reps, one set through, maybe two sets through, very few actual reps total. Protect your shoulders because no matter how long this takes you to set up and do, doing this for like eight minutes is going to save you hours if you have to go off the water because of injury. All right. This is my last attempt for the APB fast track. Seriously, the end. I want to break 10 miles an hour in these fresh, flat, stagnant water. I hit 11 in salt water. I'll post the time because other people are posting salt water times. But for me, this is what I have access to. It's the same board, it's 14 by 23 LTD. The water is fresh. The water is still. I'm running the Black Project Sonic Fin. Up until now, I have been running the Hippo Stick Triple G. I love that paddle. I would like to use it again, but I think I need a really big blade and all I have access to my biggest blade right now is the Puakea Catch-22, my old yellow blade. I've cut that down to head high. It's increased the stiffness, decreased the weight. Still a pretty big blade. It has a very good catch. All right, let's do this. I had done everything right that day and I was decent with my training for the past couple of weeks. The only thing to do now was to try and relax into my effort. Of course, my brain kept replaying a few last minute tips that I think actually made a big difference in my efforts. Yeah, and the new Garmin that I got, the 935, it tells you your distance per stroke. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter because I can't tell when I'm paddling. But what I'm finding when I race, and I'm kind of, I call it chasing, not full sprinting, but kind of sprinting, chasing people, I'll lose about a foot in distance per stroke but I'm gaining about 15 strokes a minute at nine feet. So I'm actually gaining speed that way with a higher turnover, but at the maximum speed when I sprint, right at the end, I'll go from like nine and a half, 10 and a half feet per stroke to 13 or 14 per stroke with a longer, harder, faster stroke right before I pass out. So like that weird transition, like I'm efficient, okay, I'm transitioning, accelerating, I'm losing efficiency at the very end, it's like, well, you're efficient, you're long, you're doing everything right, and uh, the human limit's kicking in, you're done soon. Okay, hop up, get the momentum building with a strong, powerful stroke. Then, when you feel the board lift up, sprint short and fast, as fast as you possibly can. Then, when you feel like you're gonna vomit and you can't hold it anymore, make it worse and go back to longer and heavier. I think it takes longer than the sprint just to think of all of that. Enough! You want my head to explode in the name of all that is good and decent. No more for today. Just when I thought my brain or my body couldn't take any more, I sat down, did a little bit of self-reflection, and did one more piece. Every time you do a piece, you should be thinking that three minutes after, was my second stroke bad? Did I slip the third? You get a chance every time you try again to hit that higher speed and be more efficient for how many strokes you took during that period. So that's a really good, it's a really good point. Oh my god, all right, I kind of look like I got hit by a bus. But because it's alactic, it actually doesn't feel so much like I got hit by a bus. It's just that North Carolina is really hot. Um, I like to refuel when it's hot like this. I, I 
I can't usually do those thick chocolatey protein shakes or anything like that. My go-to is fresh watermelon straight into the blender. Um, and I'm going to drink it while I wait for my results to upload. Oh my God, guys, I did it right there. 10 miles an hour. Ha! Ah, on the nose, like not even a freaking like tenth of a mile an hour, a thousandth of a mile an hour to spare. Oh, I mean, that's that's cool. You know, I'm I'm proud of that time. That is me, flat water, 14 foot board, 23 inches wide. I um, I did everything right today, and I mean. That's just what, that's discipline, right? You you train for something and on the day of, you don't slack on anything. You do everything you know how to do. Discipline isn't knowing how to do the right thing. It's actually following through and doing the right thing. I think every week up until now, I've kind of just said, eh, that won't make a difference, right? And I, I skipped one of my supplements or I skipped the heavy neurological activation with the weight or you know, I didn't buff the bottom of my board. I skipped something every week. And this week, I didn't skip shit. And now I'm gonna celebrate with an ice cold watermelon juice. <laughs> Yay! All right, guys, thanks for following along. Comment in the feed below if you have any questions related to hitting max speeds, technique, anything about stand up paddling fast and for short amounts of time. I'll put links to the supplements that I've been taking, the boards I'm using, the paddles I'm using, anything you could possibly wanna know will be in the links below. Thank you so much for following along on my personal endeavor here. I hope that whatever your goal is that you reach it to.